open this Bible, and I, that's not what I need. All right, y'all can have a seat. Y'all can have a seat, because we're going we gonna to have a little girl talk today. Praise the Lord. So, as I uh, open this up, um, for those that know my family, my, I look like my father. <laughs> yeah, he, and, he, and I, he out here. I look like my father, so Annapolis is small, so when I'm in the street, it's always, oh, you lost daughter. Or you saw your sister. I don't have a name. It's just Sonia's sister or Lon's daughter. But what people fail to, fail to realize is that all this that you see in front of you today, get ready to bring God's word, is because of my mother. My mother prayed us through the teenage years. <laughs> and if y'all don't know, she even prayed Lon's onto the choir of a church. <laughs> so on this Mother's Day, uh, my mother does not go here, but she said, oh, what time church start? I said, Mom, I'm only up there for 15 minutes. She said, it don't matter. So y'all give it up for Mama Gail <laughs> Lyons. <laughs> All the things that y'all talk about about me, my controllingness and my bossiness, I get it from my mama. <laughs> so, <laughs> so y'all, we are blessed to come to you. So let's, um, let's pray, and then we're going to jump into this word. Father God, we do not take it lightly that we even have the opportunity to bring your word, Lord God, but it is your word. So I pray right now that you diminish Daphne, that you diminish hope, that you diminish Veronica, Lord God. And you only allow the words that your Holy Spirit want your people to receive, that it may land on good soil, that it will not return void, Lord God, because it is your word, and your word always accomplishes what it has been created to do. So, Lord, we thank you for your presence already in this service, Lord God, and pray that you do not leave us now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to be coming from Proverbs chapter 31, starting at verse 10. And we're going to read it from the uh, message version. And the reason that we're reading it from the message version is because it brings it up a little today to really understand what it means to be a, a good wife, a, a good mother, or in my case, which I am neither, just a good woman, okay? Amen, a virtuous woman. It says, a good woman is hard to find and worth far more than diamonds. Her husband trusts her without reserve and never has reason to regret it. Never spiteful, she treats him generously all her long life. She shops around for the best yarns and cottons and enjoys knitting and sewing. She's like a trading ship that sails to faraway places and brings back exotic surprises. She's up before dawn preparing breakfast for her family and organizing her day. She looks over a field and buys it. Then with money that she's put aside, she plants a garden. First thing in the morning, she dresses for work, rolls up her sleeves, eager to get started. She senses the worth of her work. It is in no, she is in no hurry to carry it, call it quits for the day. She's skilled in the crafts of home and hearth, diligent in homemaking. She's quick to assist anyone in need, reaches out to help the poor. She doesn't worry about her family when it snows. Their winter clothes are all mended and ready to wear. She makes her own clothing and dresses in colorful linens and silk. Her husband is greatly respected when he deliberates with the city fathers. She designs gowns and sells them, brings the sweaters she knits to the dress shops. 
Her clothes are well made and elegant, and she always faces tomorrow with a smile. When she speaks, she has something worthwhile to say, and she always says it kindly. She keeps an eye on everyone in her household and keeps them all busy and productive. Her children respect and bless her. Her husband joins in with words of praise. Many women, many women have done wonderful things, but you, you've outclassed them all. Charm can mislead and beauty soon fades. The woman to be admired and praised is the woman who lives in the fear of God. Give her everything she deserves. Adorn her life with praises. Give it up for your virtuous woman. But we're going to pause right there because I don't know about you, but just reading about what she do, I'm a little tired, okay? But now just imagine that this scripture had to be rewritten in 2024. We'd have to add a few things to the list. She's in school for continued personal growth and advancement. She's advocating for those that may be struggling in an area that she once struggled. She's running for office, leading committees, and on the board of one, maybe even two organizations. She contributes her resources to causes working for the betterment of others. She's cheerleading on the sidelines of her little ones, whether it's basketball, soccer, football, dance rehearsals, song and dance. She's doing it all. She's not just mothering her own children, but grandchildren, nieces, nephews, godchildren, in addition to children that have lost their parents or whose parents have simply lost their way. Let's not forget about the caring of our aging parents. She's continuously showing up because she knows her presence has influence. Her face is a representation of those that don't have a seat at the table or they weren't even invited at all. She is a virtuous woman. Many women do, women do noble things, but you, 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 you surpass them all. You are a 2024 virtuous woman. Proverbs 31 is very empowering. Every time I read it, especially when it gets down to the you surpass them all, I want to square my shoulders, stick out my chest, lift up my head, strut a little, little higher, stand a little taller than I would before I read it. But sometimes we need to take that cape off. So while the world and those around your sphere of influence are celebrating you, I want to take just one moment and say, but how are you doing? How are you, Shantae? How are you, Melanie? And before you answer with the normal, universal, oh, I'm good. Oh, I'm fine. I want you to take just a minute. Oh, we're we going to pause, too. I want you to take a minute and check in with your heart and check in with your head before you answer, how are you doing? Now I'm going to ask it again. How are you doing? You see, the balancing act isn't the ability to keep juggling all of the responsibilities. The balancing act of mothering, which is the title of this three-part series, <laughs> the battle and the struggle in, is balancing your sense of responsibility with wanting to sometimes just do you. Try balancing the weight of all the things on your plate with, no, today I, I just want to say no. That strong sense of being responsible can be both an internal and external struggle, both a blessing and a curse. Is there anyone other than me that just sometimes want to say, I'm not trying to be responsible today? <laughs> 
by a show of hands. Who just don't want to be responsible today? <laughs> I didn't say be irresponsible. <laughs> I said not at all have responsibility. So we're going to look back at this scripture real quick, and we're going to look at it not from the perspective of her children or her husband who were giving her praise or from the person that wrote it to personify the person. We're going to look through it through the eyes of the woman herself, the virtuous woman. Because if she was being honest and she was in a room like I am right now and in a moment of transparency, she would say, I'm tired. She would say that I'm tired, and to be honest with you, it's okay for me to be tired. It means that I'm weary, that I need some rest, that I'm not quite, not quite up to my game, that I'm not in a good space right now. Being a virtuous woman doesn't mean you never get tired and that you never want to just walk away. What sets her apart are the keys within the scripture that take up the fewest amount of lines. She would want other women to know that there's a high cost of carrying all of this responsibility, but there's a recipe that enables her to do it. So let's go to the word. In the, proverb, in the, in the segment of Proverbs that I read, verses 10 through 31, it's a total of 22 verses, 22. And just like the world, the majority of the verses focus on what she do. 13 of those verses focus on what she does. I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this. And that's what the world honors and praises. Six of them highlight the, the reward that she gets, the praise of her husband, the praise of the community, the praise of her children. And that's all well and fine. But how does she do it? There are only three verses out of the 22 that actually give you the secret recipe. And because I'm one of those women and I like to see all women living their best life, I'm going to tell you what those three things are. First off, she knows how to do it. She knows how to do it. People around us often focus on what we do, but in this proverb, the things of value are now grounded in what she does, but how she does it. Verse 25 and 26 says she's clothed in strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. It states that she speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She's not demanding. She's not a diva in her business, even though she is fully about her business. She's confident in who she is and who she serves and why she chooses to do all the things that she does. Though they are appreciated, she does not require the accolades of others. She is fully, fully aware of her worth with or without the accolades. The Message Bible says that she speaks when she has something worthwhile to say. Translation, in order to do all the things that she does, she does not waste her time, her energy, or her resources on things that do not feed her purpose, that do not zap from her energy, or potentially takes her away from her course of action. She knows how to do it. Bottom line, how she does it is with a level of integrity. Number two, she understands who she does it for. Verse 30 says, charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Proverbs 10 supports it and says that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. See, her level of fear in the Lord isn't I'm scared. I'm doing this because he's going to strike me down or he's going to punish me when I go off course. That's not what the fear of the Lord is. The fear of the Lord is an act of devotion. It's standing in awe and reverence. It's giving him honor. 
It's choosing to place God's plan for your life above that of anyone else's thoughts, desires, or opinions. She knows who she's serving, and she knows why. The ability, understand though, that the ability to reverence God in that manner requires that you have a relationship with him. Before you have that relationship, you are fearing God versus honoring him. But by obtaining that wisdom, you now have the knowledge to move accordingly. Lastly, she knows when not to do anything at all. With wisdom comes an understanding that there are times when we need to give ourselves permission not to do anything. Although she did a lot, yes, Lord, give it up for the wisdom. (laughs) Although she did a lot of things for others, wisdom would not allow her to do things for them that they could do for themselves. That takes wisdom. We've heard that no is a complete sentence, but wisdom tells us when and how to use it. As virtuous women, women of integrity, we should feel obligated to keep keep the commitments that we make. It's a part of being responsible. But wisdom tells us to pause and to think before we even make the commitment in the first place. (laughs) That way, we already have an out. I haven't committed. I'm not showing up. Verse 31 says, give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise at the city gates. Her hard work, respect for her spouse, foresight, encouragement, care for others, concerns for the, for the poor, wisdom in handling money. All these coupled with the fear of the Lord lead to success, enjoyment, honor, and praise. But if I can honestly speak virtuous woman to virtuous woman, while you're trying to balance all of the phenomenal things that you do, my prayer is that you make sure you add yourself to the scale. Amen. Good morning. I'm going to come to you from the balancing act of mothering to talk about the qualities of a mother. In the intricate tapestry of life, woven with the threads of virtue and character, stands the woman of Proverbs 31. Beyond the mere description of her noble qualities, lies a deeper essence, a beacon of strength and dignity, harmoniously intertwined. As we delve into the scripture that described her as the epitome of grace, we uncover motherly layers of wisdom and insight waiting to be unveiled. She is not just a woman in the Bible, but she is a living, imbo- she is living embodied of excellence and resilience. I pause here to say, mothers, you're excellent. You wonder about this woman, like Daphne said, she was tired. I was tired. I didn't think I can go through the rest of the scripture. And then to cook breakfast every day? Our family would be happy to get one meal out of the day, (laughs) or out of the week, right? But what I want us to know is that I want us to just explore her qualities of of a mother um, through this woman um, that can encourage some mothers today. Because truth be told, that was years ago, and today's life has really changed. I come to represent a mother that is raising a college student and twins that are juniors in high school. My first point that I got out of this about her qualities is that a mother's wisdom is often shown 
through actions rather than words. One part of her demonstration is faith. Our text describes her as a praying, as praying early in the morning because she was praying because she knew that it was going to take um, God to get the strength to make it through her day. Um, the more she exercised her faith, the more her family would understand why it is important. She also demonstrated wisdom. The important, it was important because she wanted her family to know that having good judgment and planning ahead leads to being prepared for whatever challenges may come. The other part that she demonstrated was resilience. Her resilience is not born of defiance, but of a quiet inner resolve that propels her forward in the face of adversity. A caring mother wants her family to know that when they face challenges, they can get through them. She knows this is important, an important quality in life for all mothers. I represent Gladys Morrow. Gladys ba Blackman Morrow, who's my mother that was the epitome of a Proverbs 31 virtuous woman, who has shaped me to who I am today. And so with that, I want to say for all mothers, no matter how heavy the storms come, be like the palm tree that stands tall and strong in the face of adversity. A mother's resilience allows her to weather life storms with grace and strength. Like the palm tree, abilities to bend but not break in strong winds, a mother's resilience enables her to adapt and overcome challenges while remaining steadfast, balancing life storms. I'm going to pause here. I'm sure you guys will agree with this next statement I'm going to say. Being a mother ain't rosy. And I'm going to say it just like that. Being a mother is not rosy. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> and I know the mothers that have gone before me, you worried about your child. They're, they're precious. They come home. I remember bringing home our twins. It was, they were... Um, it was an OJT. We already had one, but it still was an OJT because this was different. I was fearful. I was doubtful. I was like, God, can I really do this thing? Three kids? Are you kidding me? <laughs> but when I thought about it, I had to go back to what my mother taught me. I'm, a fa I'm from a family of 11. Seven girls, four boys, and I'm number 11. I grew up with a mother that was from the silent generation. They worked hard and they were quiet. I, today, am living in a generation with Generation Z. Our kids, today, are advocates for themselves. They are, um, they set boundaries where it can collide with parenting at times. <laughs> Do you hear me? Am I calling it out? They want to make decisions for themselves. They saying, back up. I got this. And then they don't want you to judge them. And that's okay, but let us help you. You don't really know everything. You don't know everything. But the one thing that my mother taught me is the one thing that Generation Z is missing. And that is, you have to listen. <laughs> Being transparent, we weren't perfect, right? We made some mistakes. And it's through our mistakes that we're trying to get you to listen to us. 
so that you won't make the same mistakes? So that you will grow and become the confident children you need to become? The confident adults? adults? If you listen at this stage, when we look back on it, if I had just listened when I was 17, when I was 15, where would I be now? I wouldn't have had to go through the storms of being broken. I wouldn't have had to go through the storms of trials that I didn't even have to experience in my life. And so now it takes us back. We, we get back up and we just, we'll talk about it a little later, but she, the, the Proverbs 31 woman, she also showed her children the faith that it took. And it's in that faith that you are resilient. It's in that faith that you got to stand. It's in that faith where you don't have the power to go on anymore. One thing about the um, Proverbs 31 woman, we didn't hear anything that she complained. We complain. It's too much. It's too hard. But like that palm tree, we have to stand up strong. We have to go against the devil and say, you're going to hit me with your best punch. Because I know that I'm going to bend and I'm not going to break. I know that I'm going to be victorious. I know that this is just for a little while. It may be five years, it may be ten years, but it's just a little while. And so just knowing that will get us to, um, to that strong place where God wants us to be. He doesn't want us to be broken and that's one thing to our young people that I'm saying this to about listening. It helps you along the way not to be broken and to miss the right peace. And the reason why we get broken is because we want to do it on our own way. We want to do it our own way. But what we forget, we forget to capture what our parents might have taught us. And that is when they brought us to church. We didn't capture what the faith in Christ was about. We wanted to go to the store and get our candy. You got candy? Pass it, pass it. We want to go to sleep. We don't want to listen. But that's a critical area in our lives. That's a critical area even where we are, where we, we don't want to let our children to go. So I say to you, we just got to be resilient. When we go through these storms, they're not for the purpose of you going through to be wiped out, but they're there to grow. And what happens is that our motherly instinct kicks in when we don't know what to do. And that is what the Proverbs 31 woman showed us. She said, she showed us how to manage her household amongst all those tasks. She showed us how to manage them so that we will be able to, like she did in the morning. How many of you, let's take a poll. How many of you early in the morning, the first thing out of your mouth is to pray to God? To bend down. Sometimes God needs us in a different position. He needs us to bend on our knees, to be prostrate, and to pray for our day. We have to pray for our children. We have to ask God to protect them. Because we're not with them every day, so we don't know what is in our schools. We, have to, we don't know what they are up against. And truth be told, we don't even know all of the challenges that our kids face. Not just on the surface, but internally. And as a result, Matthew 5.32 reads, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt does, loses its saltiness, how can it be made uh, salty again? My se the second thing that the Proverbs 31 woman teaches us or wants us to know is that a mother's power to influence her children is profound. Let me say that again. A mother's power to influence her children is profound. As the Proverbs 31 woman is often seen as a model of virtue and strength, we see the powerful influence a mother can have on her children. I'm going to talk about my mom. We were a religious family. My mom and my dad were the deaconess and de deacon and deaconess of our church. 
My mother's role on Sunday morning was to cook dinner ahead of time. We all went to Sunday school out of the house. When my mother got to church, she didn't come by herself. I was with her because I was the youngest. But we picked up every motherboard member. Y'all might not know that. I might be dating myself. But that was a mother's board. They were our seniors. She taught me how to um, respect my elders, to see to their needs. She taught me how to make sure that their needs are met. Um, but the funny thing about it is that when they got in the car, they said, did you have my pound cake today? <laughs> and that influence helped me today. I look after the seniors, and I love to bake. I love to bake. It's, it's, it's what has influenced me to continue to, um, to look after those around me that stand in need. Because truth be told, even though our seniors may have family, they're not the ones that really take care of our seniors. They're not the ones that step up and do for them. And as a result, my daughter, she bakes now. And she even bakes cookies better than me. I don't even go in the kitchen anymore. But how many of you remember those little eyes watching you in the kitchen, then one day saying, Mama, I want to make those pancakes today. Does that, did that happen to anybody? No? No? Okay. <laughs> They just ate and act like they didn't know where the food came from. <laughs> and that's probably it right there. And then how many of you remember the way your daughter might have looked at you putting on makeup and at a certain age could not wait to show you how they can do it? I remember a story with Janiya. She was only a few weeks old, and I was going back to work, and I was putting on makeup one day, and this little girl was looking at me like she was just in awe, like, wow, what is she doing? I wish I could get up there and do it, right? And I looked at her, and I was like, oh, my gosh, one day you're going to be doing this. And today she's doing it, and it's something that you carry on. But the thing about it is we don't really know what we do in front of our children. They're watching. And that's the important piece about it, the least little things. It's not the big things that you do that everybody know about your drama. It's the little things. And every time you do something in front of them, that's when you're adding the salt to their lives. The salt that this is talking about is not the salt so much that it is um, it's salt like we do, because well, we know that salt flavors. We know that salt gives us a seasoning if it loses it. But we're talking about the influence and the impact that you make in your children's lives for their future, for getting them, giving them guidance um, to live off of. The importance of maintaining values and principles is apparent despite changing times and generational differences. By standing true to the beliefs and, be, and being a positive role model, you can continue to have a meaningful influ influence on your children. Similarly, the Proverbs 31 woman uh, had qualities of, of a virtuous woman who is powerful in influencing her family and her community. The scriptures can give us inspiration to strive to be strong and nurturing, uh, and a nurturing presence in our children's lives. By embodying the virtues of wisdom, strength, and kindness, you can guide and support your, your children as they navigate the challenges of growing up today. Reflecting on the biblical, principle, the biblical teachings and applying them to your parenting approach, you can leverage your personal experience and values to a positive influence on your children that helps them to grow into being that confident and compassionate individual. The Proverbs 31 woman showed her, fam her children how to love because it was going to teach them how to be compassionate for others. She showed them that people will remember how you made them feel versus what you said. 
As our children master this skill, they have the potential to bring light to a dark world. The Proverbs 31 woman had a good work ethic. Every mother knows we want our children to grow up and be able to take care of themselves. Additionally, when you work for something, you appreciate it a whole lot more and you take better care of it. A mother who fosters a sense of security, trust, and strong relationships with her child is better equipped to provide essential guidance, companionship, and care that contributes to their child's overall happiness. In addition, the Proverbs 31 woman showed them to the importance of balancing life. The Proverbs 31 woman, she really exemplified the significance of leading a balanced life, demonstrating to her children her ability to juggle various responsibilities. A mother wears many hats, and this example teaches her children that they also have the ability to manage multiple classes in school, excel at work, and master extracurricular activities. Truth be told, multitasking was clearly originated by mothers who constantly sacrificed their families. Sacrificed for their families. Second Corinthians 12, 9 reads, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My last point that the Proverbs 31 woman wants to let us know is that a mother doesn't have to be perfect. Let me say that again. A mother does not have to be perfect. She just has to be available. She must be available to her children because her presence and support is crucial for their emotional well-being and development. Focus, focusing on doing everything right is not the goal. Her, avail, her availability and presence are more impactful in shaping her child's life. She must be available to the community through ministry. Her ministry helps her strengthen the bonds within the neighborhood, making connections and relationships with others through shared beliefs and values that makes the, the, her the number one cheerleader uh, known by all. She can contribute to a sense of unity and support within the community. My godmother in my neighborhood gathered all the children on Saturday morning and had us learning the Bible, learning Bible scriptures, learning how to speak, and learn, um, learning how to um, memorize verses. And I tell you, that is what impacted my faith, Mrs. Shirley Richards. She impacted my faith to be strong and courageous, to never give up and to trust God no matter what. She, didn't have, she was a virtuous woman and had no children. In fact, she asked my parents, Gladys, you already got 10 kids. Can I just have her? <laughs> and so my mother said, you can't have her, but I'll let you keep her sometimes. And I was with her a lot, and she um, really um, influenced my life, my spiritual life, let me say that. Um, and so she taught me, to be available to God's plan, just as the Proverbs 31 woman. This is the last thing she does. She teaches us to be uh, available to God's plan because God has uniquely designed each mother to run their own race. I, he promised to support us every step of the way. God has a specific purpose for every mother that he has redeemed. God has a specific purpose for every mother he has redeemed. And if you have been redeemed, he will guide you. Trust God who calls you to run the race because he will help you cross the finish line. In closing, a mother's wisdom is not often spoken, but it's demonstrated through the powerful influence on her children. Mothers do not have to be perfect. They just need to be present in the, in the lives of their family. The impact of mother's guidance can leave lasting legacies and valuable lessons of their children, even if we did not have the guidance of our biological mother. God places others in our lives who helps us embody the qualities of a nurturing mother. 
Let us reflect on the Proverbs 31 woman and allow her example of the qualities of a mother to inspire us to cultivate the strength, grace, and unwavering faith in our lives. Happy Mother's Day to all. I'm coming from balancing the act of a mothering. Why we say mothering is because you don't have to have a baby to be a mother, to mothering. And we want to include everyone. Amen? I'm going to give some testimonies today. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I know when I was becoming a minister here at First Christian, I had to go in front of the Board of Stewards, and they had to ask me some questions. I don't remember who asked me this question. I kind of know, but I don't want to get it wrong. But I remember my answer, amen? And my answer was to do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. That is my motto. And I have lived out what I have spoken in the atmosphere. Then unbeknownst to me, I became a caregiver approximately 33 years. Amen? I'm a, my job is, uh, my um, assignment is talking about caregivers. Caregiver is a person who provides sincere and dependable care for children, elderly people, those who have severe illnesses, or accident. And as an experienced caregiver, I'm giving you some more testimony, amen? While living in Georgia, there were six loved ones who had stayed in my home for a short period of time. While living in Maryland, there were 22 loved ones who stayed in my home for a day, short, or long period of time. Four were in hospice. Two hospice um, were family members that lived with my home until Jesus called them home. And one of the hospice at my home was my husband, which today is his first anniversary being with Jesus. Amen? A caregiver is not talked about a lot, but they do a lot of things. Then we ask them, why do you become a caregiver? Unknowingly, we become one, then sometimes it's just thrown on us. We're the only child in the family, or we may be the oldest child, but we have to become that caregiver. And being a caregiver is truly a balanced act. It's extra work, and there's a lot of sacrifice. And when you be sacrificing, you got a lot of things you have to do. In the household, there's more work to do. You got a managing and monitoring around the clock their medicine. You have to be organized because if you want someone to come in to help you, you're going to have to have that paperwork laid out to let them know when they get their next medicine. Amen? You don't want to tell them because we forget as human beings. And then, you know, it goes on that you got to take them to the doctor's office. And if they're in a the wheelchair, that's a lot of heavy weight, pushing back and forth. Amen. You have to ask them for information. Okay, what do you want or how you want to do it? But then you have to make arrangements for them for transportation. You got to go food shopping, not just for yourself. You have to go to them for food for them because they may be on a special diet. Amen. You got to cook meals, not just for the person you can for, but for your whole household. You see, it's a whole lot of sacrifice. It's a whole lot of doing. Amen? Then you got to be constant. you got to observe your caregiver. You see, they're not going to tell you everything at one time, what they need. You have to be able to know that, hey, he's not looking or she's not looking too good today. What's the problem is? And I'm telling you, I, had, I was a caregiver that took take care of them. I had uh, my uncle. I took care of him. Sometimes we fail to ask for help, and it's hard on you. We got to let that pride go 
And then we have some family members that don't wanna, won't even step up to the plate. And it's hard. It's really hard. I remember taking care of my uncle. I had a couple of people helping me. But that wasn't enough. I was cooking the meals. I was taking them to the doctors. I was taking them to the hospital. I was doing his um, medication. And people was looking at me and saying, Hope, you look tired. You need a rest. Oh, no, I was an ever-ready battery person. I was doing it all. And I said, okay, I'm all right. I'm doing okay. Then my husband got some, uh, he was working for the company. He got orders to go to Hawaii. I said, I want to go to Hawaii. He said, well, ho he said, okay. So he took me to Hawaii. Went to Hawaii. I stayed in the bed sleeping. He said, what's wrong with you? I said, I'm just tired. I'm just tired. Then God is good. They extended his time there, so we went to a luau, and we went on the beach. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> God is good. He know exactly what you need when you win it. So he was, the, the patient was supposed to go to my sister's house. Come find out he went to the hospital. He was in the hospital the whole time I was away. So I had to come back. My husband said, he ain't going to kill my wife. So he got to go. I'm telling you. He said he got to go. You got to know my husband, how he was, and he met that thing. So <laughs> we had to take him back to his home. And I could not talk. My voice was gone. I'm telling you, my voice was gone. I could, and we was moving his stuff back to his house, moving it back. I was going up and down the steps. My voice was gone. As soon as I put the last thing in the house, I could talk just like that. <laughs> and that's the truth. I got some witness can tell you it's the truth. And sometimes we need that help. People don't realize we need the help. It's a whole lot. It's a whole lot on you. Getting up every four hours and, and um, giving them the medicine. And then you got a six hour giving them the medicine. You need help. I remember, you know, you reap what you sow. And I remember my sister. She would help Camelia. They put out a, a, a thing in the church saying, somebody, could, could you help Camelia go to the doctors or come to the house? And, and the church st stepped up to the plate. And my sister was one of them. She would take her to the doctor. She would stay there with her. She would help her all she know how. But then when my sister got sick, Hallelujah. They put, out the, put, out, put it out again. And I mean, there were people that come stepping up to the plate, taking her to chemo, taking her to um, uh, um, the other thing. <laughs> Why well, come to me in Jesus' name? <laughs> it will. And I mean, she had help all the time. People even was taken off from work just to help her. That is a sign of that you reap what you sow. Now, if you're not sowing real good seeds, don't expect any good seeds. If you're not helping out when you're supposed to help out, you know, you don't get that anymore. But I'm telling you, family, step up to the plate. If there's a person there that needs to be caregiver, help her. She needs your help. Help him. He needs your help. I'm telling you, God is good. And and after that, you know, the Bible says, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And that's the kind of thing you have to show when you are a caregiver. You got to show them love. You got to show them some peace. You got to show them that you care about them. You got to show that you love them. You need to stop sometime and have a little conversation. They got something to say. Listen to them sometimes. They need your help. And you need them to be okay too. Because you don't want them to give you Hades all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
You don't want them. <laughs> you truly don't want them to be that way because it makes it even harder on you. Amen? So you need to show that love and that gentleness. Sometimes you have to go out your way, and in the way, that, and later on they'll appreciate it. Amen. But we need to get families to come together to help one another to care for the loved ones that are sick, that need extra help. It's hard on people. Matthew 25 and 36 says, "You know when you do help, when you do caregiving, you are um, fulfilling scriptures." Have you ever quoted your scripture say, um, God, your will and your way according to your word? Your will and your way according to your word? Well, let me tell you, when you caregiving, you're doing a lot of word. Because in Matthew 25, 36, it says, I needed clothes and you clothed me not. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And the disciples asked, Jesus, when did we do this? Jesus said, if you do it to the least one, you do it unto me. Amen. And that's what we have to do. We have to do it with one another. Amen. And then he got 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 7. He said, love is patient. Yes, it is. And love is kind. And 7 said, it always protects, always trusts. Always hope and always preserve. We have to protect the person that we're taking care of. I remember my sister, we had to put, bring the bed things up on her because she wanted to get out the bed. And I came downstairs one time and she was said, I tried to get out of here, I couldn't get out of here. And I had to laugh because we had to put the because she wanted to get out the bed. She wanted to go to the bathroom by herself, but she couldn't do it. It was to the late stages. So we got to learn how to protect them. And um, also we got to learn that they are people, they are human. Although they are not in the right mind sometimes, we have to take care of them. We have to protect them. We have to love them just like they were when they were doing the right things because they appreciate it. They will appreciate it. And somebody in the family will come and say, thank you for doing what you can do. We can't treat them any kind of way. No, you got to remember, you going to get old. And how you treat them, you may get it back. You're not going to stay young all your life. You may not be healthy all your life. So we have to keep that in the back of our mind. How would you want somebody to treat you? Amen. How would you want somebody to treat you? So that's what you have to do. Treat them with love and kindness. Amen? And they got to trust you. They, you say, well, I'll be back and give you the next medicine, you know, not three and four hours later. It happens. I remember when I, um, I had a girlfriend. Her mother was in the, um, the rehab, the nursing home. It hurt my heart to see how they treated her. She was a sweet lady. And when I went to that nursing home, I mean, they did not treat her good at all. And it took me a long, long time to go to a nursing home because of that. And then when you went in there, you could smell. And it took me a long time to go back to a nursing home. But then when I went back to one, it didn't smell like that one smell. Amen? And if you put your people in the nursing homes, go and see about them. Go and see them about them. Just don't wait. And if they're not doing something right, speak up for them. You got to be their mouthpiece. Amen? People in the nursing home today are not getting treated properly. And if you put your loved one in there and let them be in there for days and days, set up a schedule with your other um, family members. You go this day, I go this day. You go this day and I go this day. You have to check on your people. You say you love me 
and you got me laying up in this bed, and I got all kinds of sores all over my body, laying in urine and feces, the truth will set you free. We got to go and see about them because we are mothering them. You are mothering them. No matter how old you are, you are mothering them as a caregiver. And you got to take care of them. Don't tell me you love me and gonna treat me any kind of way or show, show me you're not doing what you're supposed to do. God is not pleased with that. Amen. And that's who looking at look at you. We may not see you, but God looking at you. He's checking you out. You go reap what you sow. Always remember that. And 2 Corinthians 3, 2 and 23, you're still fulfilling these scriptures as a caregiver. You are yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read for everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ. You show that you are a letter from Christ. The result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets or stone, but in the tablets of a human heart. Amen? You are written word, read by many. People are looking. People are taking notes, whether you know it or not. Uh, one lady came to me, she knew who I was. And she described me to the T. So that's just let me know I got to do what thus I say, thus saith the Lord God. When I'm walking and when I'm talking, you just can't do and say anything at any time. If you're a person of your word, I'm going to do this, then you do that. Because you want somebody to do the right thing for you, you do the right thing for somebody else. Amen. And Proverbs 31 is from the Message Bible. These are the scriptures that, that really touched my heart. It said, many women have done wonderful things but you'll outclass them all. The woman to be admitted, I mean, excuse me, the woman to be admired and praised for the woman who lives in fear of God. Give her everything she deserves. Amen? Please, take care of your loved one. You say you're going to do it, do it. If you're not going to do it, don't do it. That's just like the um, in the scripture, it said that the father asked one guy, would you help me in the fields? He said, no. He asked the other one, would you help me in the fields? He said, yes. But the one said, yes, never showed up. But the one said, no, showed up. So we got to keep our word. And remember, you reap what you sow. Amen. Amen. All week, Minister Hope been fighting off the enemy health-wise. Did y'all notice she left her cane at her seat as she preached? As she kept moving from side to side, I'm like, Veronica, we be ready to catch her. If we got to catch her, we got to catch her. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 